Um, without further ado, we'll jump in this uh, and start rolling. Um, before we get um, too far into it, I want to just you know, make mention that everything we do at the city flows from a five-year strategic plan that we call Independence for All that our city council adopted two years ago. Uh, there's four main parts of that plan. We are trying to be customer focused. We're trying to become financially sustainable. We're trying to grow our community and grow our economy. And we're trying to promote quality in our neighborhoods, quality in our infrastructure, and uh, improve um, the uh, public safety um, for our residents, both in terms of our police personnel and our fire and EMS services. Um, two years into this plan, um, we're right on track. We've delivered on 40% of the plan. Uh, and that is a direct result of the hard work of our employees. Um, and while we're really proud of what we've gotten done in the last two years, it's my contention that we are now starting to get into some of the trickier, more challenging parts of that plan. Like, how do we start to um, turn around the crime rate? How do we start to grow the community where our population growth has been pretty flat for the last decade or two? How do we start to grow and diversify our revenue sources? Um, these are the kind of things that we're trying to tackle uh, in this budget. Uh, we do a citizen satisfaction survey every two years. Um, so we got one this past November in 2018. A lot of the items in the budget are a direct reflect of the requests and the priorities that we're hearing from the citizens. A lot of the items in this budget though are also about trying to address what we believe are the basic needs of our citizens every day. Um, trying to make sure that issues of social equality, issues of economic equality, all of those things are addressed in a, a fair and sustainable manner. Speaking of fair and sustainable, we also know that we have an employee workforce and an um, employee uh, retiree cadre that we need to make sure we provide um, sustainable benefits packages as well there too that help us attra attract and retain and recruit employees uh, to our city so that we can provide the basic services that we need to see every single day because these are what our citizens are expecting of us. So that's really what this strategic plan's about uh, and that's really what this budget's trying to address from a uh, philosophical standpoint. When you talk about our strategic plan though, uh, that name, Independence for All, it really is, if you stop and think about it, pretty profound. Um, you know, that really says that we are trying to deliver upon the promises of this plan for all 120,000 residents that work here and all 1,000 employees that work here and all of our retirees that either live here or still live outside the area. Um, I think our challenge, though, is making sure that we live up to that name, Independence for All. And if you spend any time around the city, you've often heard people make a uh, distinction between Eastern Independence and Western Independence. And that really got me thinking as we started working on the budget this year, I wonder if there's a way to really measure that or think about that. So started playing around and started looking at this big green zip code 64057 uh, that's out east and up in the northwest corner 64053. Um, you know, two sides of town, two different issues, but wondered what that looked like. Uh, and the numbers really started to bear that out. Um, you see issues of median um, home value, a big disparity there. Out east here, that's about $203,000. Up in the northwest part of the city, that's about $88,000. Um, unemployment's about 3% down uh, in 64057. It's over 8% up north. Um, I think the thing that really resonated the most with me, though, uh, in our country, in the United States, the average citizen lives 78 years. If you live down in 64057, you're going to beat that. O on average, folks down there live 80 years. Up in the northwest part of the city, folks are living 70 years. So just based on where you live, there's a 10-year difference in life expectancy in our city. Um, and I think that is a real eye-opener for us and something that we have a moral and ethical obligation as a city to start to figure out how do we start to attack that to where quality of life, access to jobs, access to transit, uh, all those things are addressed so that we can start to close that gap that exists in our community and we can stop making a distinction between East and West independence. And I would say probably the biggest challenge for us to do that, the biggest barrier I should say, is making sure that we have the money to do it. Um, most of the problems that we have in the city uh, are by and large money solvable problems. If there was more money, we would be able to tackle a lot of these things. So we are challenged, as are many governments across the country, with a paradigm shift that's happening over the course of the last few years in how we are funded. Um, for many years in our city, Independence has relied upon retail sales tax to provide its services. That's been our calling card. We do not have a 
personal property tax like Lee Summit or Blue Springs or Kansas City. Um, many years ago, in fact, I think it was back in the 60s, the city made a bargain with the voters that in exchange for uh, eliminating a personal property tax, we would put in place a 1% local option sales tax. And the idea was sound. Let's have our services paid for by and large people who come into the community to shop. And when Lee Summit didn't really have a lot of those shopping centers and Blue Springs didn't, and people were, the economy was growing, this really worked well for us. But since that time, both of those cities have added uh, shopping outlets and shopping centers, so they stopped hemorrhaging those dollars. But as we all know, people are now shopping online more. Um, I saw a report the other day, and I've been sharing this in this presentation. Um, a national report came out that this year, for the first uh, four months of the calendar year, 2019, there have been 6,000 stores uh, that closed um, uh, nationwide. All of last year, there were 5,800. So in the first four months of the year, we've already surpassed the number of retail stores that have closed. The budget I put together has a mere 0.65% growth in retail sales tax. Um, so when we talk about wanting to provide additional services or provide um, the fair, equitable wages uh, for our employees, this is a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge that we as city leaders have an obligation to meet. How do we start to attract new businesses with their better paying? How do we start to provide housing stock where people want to move into this community? How do we reduce the crime rate where we're seen as a safe place to relocate a company and bring employers to? Um, these are the kind of challenges that we grapple with every single day. And when we started grappling with it, really was this past November when we had our third annual uh, strategic planning session with the council. And against the backdrop of these kind of issues, along with what we're seeing in our citizen satisfaction survey, we asked the council, where do you want to focus this year? And these were the five priorities they came up with, everything from investing in public safety to trying to make more of a noticeable impact on public infrastructure and reducing blight. Uh, these are the priorities that the council is telling us to make uh, happen in this year's budget. So then we move into the budget development process. And the budget that we've put together for this year is total, all funds, citywide, $320 million. That's 2.5% more than last year. That is primarily driven by the fact that we have increased funding for capital maintenance and capital improvements, particularly in the Power and Light Fund. Um, there's uh, rebuilds for substations. Um, there's you know in infrastructure upgrades for our transmission and distribution network. Uh, so that is really driven by um, capital. The general fund is our fund that really provides the most basic services, and that's the one we talk about a lot. Uh, general fund uh, isn't supported by a rate structure like electric, water, and sewer. It is not you know, subject to sales tax exclusively like those other voter-approved funds. So it really relies on a diversity of sources, and it's the one that we have to um, really pay the most attention to. So I spend a lot more time talking about it, but our other funds you know, certainly have their unique issues as well. But when we specifically talk about the general fund this year, um, some of the pressure points that are compounding that uh, are about an $850,000 increase for city employee salaries. Uh, we have a $520,000 increase in our pension obligations, uh, which are of course mandated by loggers and, and the state law. Um, we have a million dollar increase in our workers' compensation uh, funds, uh, primarily due to a number of large claims that we experienced in the last year. Um, we have historically in the city underfunded overtime. Uh, that is particularly true in our fire department with our minimum manning uh, requirements. Um, so we have an increase of $600,000 for overtime in there. And then um, the last several years, um, because of some very strong um, city leadership, particularly from what we call our Stay Well Advisory Committee, um, we have been able to stave off a health insurance increase for premiums um, but this year, that is not the case. Um, the cost of health insurance continues to escalate for medical care and for pharmaceutical care. So there is an 8% increase built in uh, for that. In the general fund, that equates to $923,000. Um, so those are some of the pressure points all in all that led to about a $3.6 million shortfall that we have to sit down and tackle uh, for this year. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about what did make it into the recommended budget. Um, again, we operate off of that strategic plan and four goal areas. So first goal area is customer service. Um, there's a couple of, you know, I, I'm not gonna go through every comprehensive recommendation. I will tell you our budget is online. 
Um, and we did a little bit more in-depth the other evening if you want to see more of that. But a couple of highlights that I would share with you. Um, we do have uh, funding in there for an additional customer service supervisor uh, in our water customer service um, fund. Uh, as you've probably seen on the news, that has been a challenged area for us this past year. Um, so we're looking to bring in some additional support to help uh, those fine employees out there uh, tackle the issues that uh, we've experienced there. Um, we have added in this budget what we call automatic vehicle locators. A very common call that we get to the city is when is my street going to be plowed? Um, so this technology allows a resident to get online, see where the plows have been, where they're at, and when they can expect it to get to them. Also helps the supervisors kind of know, uh, you know, where are the drivers, uh, how fast are they going, material, things like that. So a couple of things really aimed at trying to hit on the key areas that in the last year especially um, we've heard from our residents uh, and we're trying to be responsive to that. Um, a big part of this budget though of course is financial sustainability. As I've mentioned, it's, it's really our belief that it's going to be very difficult to make any meaningful progress on delivering upon our citizens' expectations uh, if we don't begin to stabilize and grow uh, our, our revenues and, and control our long-term expenditures. So this is really a big part of where the budget is focused this year. Um, something that we did last year that is really paying a lot of dividends for us, we combined many departments uh, that would be finance, law, human resources, and technology services into one single department. Um, that has not only generated a lot of operating efficiency, so people you know, being able to work more efficiently, but it's derived a lot of cost savings for us. So because of that, we're able to eliminate four vacant positions this year. Um, one of the vacant positions we are eliminating is a cybersecurity specialist. Um, I don't know if you paid attention some to the news, but issues of cybersecurity are, are really important for both public and private businesses these days, protecting consumer information and private and personal data. Because of that, we are looking to hire a cybersecurity consultant, but the cost of that still falls far below what the full-time salary and benefits would be for uh, a full-time position for us. So um, we're excited about the direction that's headed. Um, we are also in this budget reflecting, we made a recent decision uh, to outsource a significant part of our legal uh, aid services for the city. Um, this did have a human impact. Um, it led to the elimination of four filled positions uh, in the city law department. Uh, the methodology here is to try to provide more robust, um, consistent, uh, and efficient legal services. Um, and managing the needs that we have as a city. So for example, we have seven different bargaining units that we uh, have relationships with at the city. We do not really have an established um, uh, on staff expertise for that. Um, so we wanna have somebody who sort of understands us better and can help us manage and strengthen those relationships. Um, again, these workers' compensation costs are escalating at a, a pace that is not sustainable. Um, so again, outsourcing some of those issues so that not, we not only can get better cost control around that, but if in the event one of our employees is injured on the job, that we get better representation uh, and care around that. Um, so we think there's a cost savings here, but also a better uh, customer service uh, as well. Okay, rolling on, um, there are a number of places when we start really turning over um, the different uh, services in the city where we noticed a pretty substantial subsidization uh, of that. What I mean by subsidization is we are either charging a certain amount for that service, but it's, it's not the full amount of what it costs us to provide it, or the service is uh, not utilized at its full level. Uh, so there's a, um, you know, the revenues that come in associated with that. So what we're seeking to do here is close the gap on some of those inefficiencies uh, so that we can make better use of the limited dollars that we do have. Um, two of those in particular that I will highlight um, we provide across the street at the Palmer Center uh, daily a senior adult nutrition program. There are about 70 people on average every day who take advantage of that. That is by and large grant funded. However, the cost of that program exceeds the, the value of the grant to the tune of $90,000. So we have to subsidize from the general fund an additional $90,000 to cover that cost. Um, what I have challenged uh, our Parks, Recreation and Tourism Director and his staff with is over the course of this next budget year, finding ways to operate that program in a more cost-effective way. So that does not mean that anybody is losing their job. 
That does not mean that we're telling those 70 people to go eat lunch at Denny's. That is saying find a way to provide that service more efficiently. So that the cost of that is more in line with the value of the grant that we're getting. Uh, the second one where we know is a pretty significant public subsidy is around our public transit system. Uh, this recommendation uh, would bring the total number of hours for that down, would reduce it by 1,700 hours. Specifically, we're looking to eliminate three hours on Saturday and one hour on a couple of our routes during the weekday. Um, this is really rooted in data that we get from KCATA, who's our operating partner. Um, the most we are going to charge somebody to get on the bus is a buck fifty, but on average, it's costing us five dollars and thirty-two cents to drive folks around on this bus route. Uh, so we're looking at the places where the service is not utilized as much, uh, and those ones that I specifically mentioned are where we're looking to eliminate that. Um, there are some places, there are some routes where the cost is actually higher than that. It's costing us over eight dollars to provide that service. So this looks to bring that back in line without you know, charging people an egregious amount and really, again, meeting um, the need where it's at. Where we can, we're looking to grow revenue, and there's a couple of places where it appears historically we have underfunded that. One of those is in our business license fees. So every business that operates in independence per our city code has to have a business license. Uh, there's a very complicated fee associated with that uh, based on your gross sales as a business. Um, but the maximum, there's a cap on there, the maximum that we would charge somebody uh, is $30,000. There is uh, six businesses in the city who hit that cap right now, uh, some of your larger uh, industrial and commercial businesses. What this would do would change that formula on gross sales to raise that cap to $50,000. Um, that would generate an extra $195,000 for the general fund. So this is one we feel like it does not adversely impact a wide array of businesses. Um, but generates some pretty substantial revenue for our uh, general fund. We also took a, a look at our drop-off depot. So our drop-off depot is where our citizens can bring um, debris, um, old washing machines and lawn mowers and just junk, quite frankly. Um, we prefer that to it going either in the landfill or illegal dumping, but there are two issues associated with that. One, our fee structure has been set such that we're only recovering about 74% of the cost. So that's about a 25% subsidy out of the general fund. There are two months where it's really not very heavily utilized, March and November. Usually pretty cold those two months or you know, uh, inclement weather. So those are the two lowest attended. Making those two changes uh, is gonna generate about $22,000 in additional revenue for us. So um, that, that was that one. Um, our utilities, I'll mention them briefly because they are important. Um, they are also seeking to make sure that they keep up uh, with our goal of being financially sustainable. Two things in particular I'd highlight, substantial investments in capital. Um, if we stay ahead of those issues, it's never going to be more cheaper to address things than it is today. Uh, so we're trying to address as many of our deferred maintenance projects as we can. We're also taking a more suspicious look at some of our vacancies and trying to understand do we really need these positions? Does it still meet the needs? So there are a number of uh, well we call unnecessary in our opinion vacant positions that are being eliminated. That brings down the overall cost of operating the utilities. That controls the long-term cost of rates for our customers. Okay so um, employee benefits are a big part of this budget um, and there's a couple of highlights I'd like to share with you. Um, except where we have previously negotiated different amounts with our um, um, represented employees, uh, this budget provides a 1% across the board increase. Um, we have our uh, uh, Missouri Loggers Retirement System contribution in here. That's an 18.3 contribution. That's 18.3% of payroll uh, that the city's making. Uh, and then throughout the city, we have what we call longevity pay, which is calculated based on your years of service. Um, that is also appropriately funded in the budget as well. Um, as I mentioned a little bit ago, I don't need to rehash it too much, but there's an 8% increase for our premium increase for our employees, uh, health insurance. I make note that the city pays 80% of that cost. So again, with the general fund, that's about a million dollars and we've appropriately budgeted for those amounts in our other city funds as well. Uh, the budget does make several recommendations regarding health insurance and I'll mention those specifically in just a moment, but I'll begin by kind of explaining the logic that went into this. Um, health insurance costs are 
increasing, um, not just for our organization, but for public and private entities um, nationwide. Um, in our budget year, those are expected to grow uh, over $20 million this year. Um, for the retiree portion of that is $8 million. So that eight is into the $20.5 million. But um, we, we are experiencing cost increases across the board. Um, by comparison, um, some of our neighboring communities are seeing about 18% premium increases. I'm really proud, again, of our Stay Well Committee and their management of that fund, which has helped us minimize ours to around 8%. Um, but the cost of insurance is going up. Um, Independence has a um, benefit for our retirees um, to continue to provide health insurance services. Um, we are becoming more and more unique in that. Right now, there's about 18% of employers nationwide, public and private, that are still continuing to afford that. That's down from about 37%. Uh, in the year 2000. So really what we were looking to try to do here with insurance this year um, is manage the long-term costs while trying to m remain a competitive employer um, and, and ensure that some of the long-term obligations we've made, um, that to the best of our ability, we continue uh, to honor those. So specifically, uh, what we're looking at are a couple of recommendations. Um, number one, and some of this gets a little wonky, um, and I know there are some city employees and retirees here tonight. I want to let you know that we've been in contact um, the last several days with Lockton, who's our health insurance advisor. Uh, we are working with Lockton to set up at least three different seminars uh, to go into this more in depth, specifically what these changes are, but also to have breakout sessions so that people can understand how does this impact me directly. So if you have um, a medical condition that requires a number of prescriptions or um, some chronic conditions. Um, we are setting those up um, so that the people can go and understand how the proposal might impact them. And we're looking to do that over the course of hopefully the next two weeks so that there's still plenty of time for this to be um, digested and our elected officials to contemplate it before June the 17th. So right now the city offers two different insurance plans. We call those OAP1 and OAP2. Can you come backwards? Um, OAP, that stands for open access. Um, OAP2 is what we call a high deductible plan. Uh, that means an employee would have a health savings account. What we're trying to do is encourage employees to migrate over there. Um, the upside of that is that it puts healthcare management decisions more in the employee's hands. The downside of that is it increases the cost of our OAP1, which has been traditionally the plan that most of our city employees have uh, signed up for. Um, OAP2 works really well if you are a high user of medical services or if you don't use those very frequently at all. Um, these um, are very complicated um, formulas. They're ones that, again, that we want to set up seminars on. Um, but right now with this one specifically, um, the savings for this budget year, because our health insurance fund does operate on a calendar year, so we only capture six months of savings, this would bring about $700,000 of savings uh, to the city um, as a whole. The second uh, change here would move our employees who retire between the age of 55 and 65 to a 50-50 cost share on their premiums over a three-year period. Uh, right now that has been fixed at the same 80-20 split that our active employees enjoy. Uh, this would gradually step that down from 70-30 to 60-40 and then to 50-50 thereafter. Um, Migrating to that uh, approach would save about $238,000 over a six-month period. Um, I should mention that with both one and two, um, the city, this, these work a lot better if the city gets in on the action and contributes to an employee and or retiree's health savings account. Um, we've looked at some different amounts and that's because this is a proposal, uh, those are still in flux. Um, but somewhere on average between $700 and $1,000 annually uh, contributed to a health savings account. Health savings accounts are portable. That means no matter where you work or where you live, you can take it with you. It's like your own personal bank account. Those can be invested and grow um, with, you know, just like your own um, pension fund or re retirement fund, deferred comp fund. Um, but those are some of the, um, the benefits of those two. The fourth one would be taking our employees who are past the age of 65 and moving them to a Medicare supplement plan. Um, the 
Medicare uh, right now, if you're over the age of 65, federal government through the Medicare Act um, provides coverage, the city's insurance becomes supplemental. Uh, under this, we would take our retirees who number over a thousand and move them into a group plan. Um, that group plan, we went, worked with Lockton to get some quotes from several different entities. The one that we felt was the most competitive was from Blue KC. So that would, in essence, um, provide pretty identical coverage. In fact, I can say it's nearly identical coverage uh, with lower out-of-pocket amounts. Um, this one has the most significant savings to the city. In a six-month period, it's about $2.5 million or about half a million over a full year. Oh, back, Meg. Okay, <laughs> the last one is the Stay Well Clinic. Stay Well Clinic is afforded to our active employees, their spouses, their dependents, and our pre-65 retirees, dependents, spouses, etc. cetera. Um, the clinic has been a tremendous concept and it's one that we need to keep again in concept because it allows our employees and our pre-65 retirees to go get um, excellent superior medical care. Um, and in fact, uh, if our employees do what's called a health risk assessment, they get to go for free, which is a wonderful benefit to them and to our plan. However, that clinic right now in its present form is only enjoying about a 30% utilization rate. It would take closer to a 90% utilization rate to break even. So our Stay Well Fund is having to subsidize this by about a million dollars. We got a lot of homework to do uh, over the next several months to try to find a model that might work better. Um, but I can tell you philosophically, we understand what this clinic is intended to do and we need to have a pretty um, superior or even better uh, you know, identical option in place before we would hop from one lily pad to another. Uh, so that's a quick overview of that one. I'm gonna do my best to play locked in, um, but they wouldn't let me in the business school, so I'm gonna do my best to run over this with you for a minute. Uh, but this is a modeling of what this might look like for the different categories impacted. For active employees, this is again trying to incent moving over to the high deductible plan. Um, you can see some of the rationale there, which is um, putting the medical, medical management decision in the uh, employee or the enrollee's hands to try to figure out what is best for them, um, participating in future um, you know, tax-free advantages uh, and utilizing this thing, no matter if you're still employed with the city, you're retired, you're terminated, whatever. Um, on this one, uh, again, we would try to put money, uh, we would put money into a health savings account. The number we've used right now is $700 for an individual and 1000 bucks for families with dependents. Um, again, these are things that need to continue to be thought through and fleshed out, but that was the initial um, conversation starter. Um, as you can see here, um, right now an employee who is in OAP1 uh, annually is paying about 4,600 bucks. Uh, and down here on this line, their total potential liability is about $12,000. For those who would, as a family, move to the OAP2 and receive that $1,000 contribution, their annual contribution becomes $3,200, and the total liability drops to $9,200. Uh, Pre-65 retirees, this is again moving to the 50-50 cost share. Um, it also does try to incent employee or retirees to move to the uh, qualified high deductible plan, so it would be the same as what we just talked about except that the split becomes 50-50. We would seed here. Um, right now the conversation starter has been 490 for an individual, 700 for a family. Go ahead, Meg. Uh, on this one, um, this one does represent an increase. Uh, this one represents uh, annual employee contribution going from $3,300 uh, up to 3,800 bucks and the potential liability increasing from 9,300 up to $9,800. Uh, and this one is for our Medicare, the folks who are past the age of 65. Uh, this is again going out through a Blue KC plan. Um, Blue KC did come back with an option for us that they call a buy-up. A buy-up is for somebody who probably has some significant health utilization needs. Um, under that one, you're gonna pay substantially more, but it's gonna be zero dollar co-pays uh, for all of your service. Right now, um, if somebody, um, let's jump to the next slide there, Meg. Um, 
retiree, this example utilizes a retiree only. We do have information that talks about all the different scenarios. So if you're a retiree uh, and spouse, if you're a retiree with dependents, um, what, but this one just uses an example of retiree only. Those who are on OAP1 are paying $1,160 annually. That amount goes down to 468 if you just do the Blue KC Group Medicare plan. If you want the buy-up with the $0 copays, that amount would actually increase uh, and substantially to $3,200. Um, but that's, again, a personal decision based on circumstance. Out-of-pocket max goes from $4,100 down to $3,468. Uh, on this one, on Medicare, I would like to say a word that we have um, a number of employees, retirees who are past the age of 65 but have a spouse or in some cases a dependent who is obviously not age 65. Uh, we don't want to see somebody lose coverage, so the city would continue to carry them on the plan uh, until um, they reach um, age 65, where they would then move to the group Medicare plan. This is pointless because it's small um, but this is online yeah right um, <laughs> but I'll tell you what this is if you go um, um, if anybody wants us to email this Tim or you look online the very first column is if I'm a post 65 retiree and I've been on OAP one here's what I'm paying today so this probably looks like the benefit sheet you've seen from HR this middle column is what if I go to the blue KC plan the third column is what if I go to the uh, buy up and that's where you see all the zero dollars uh, down the column there. Um, but that's, that's uh, what that one is. Okay. All right. So folks often want to know, all right, what does it look like um, if we do all these insurance changes? Well, we've talked about a little bit about, um, scratch the surface on, I should say, about what happens if we, um, to, you know, in the various scenarios. But let's jump back to the city budget for just a minute. Uh, if we make these changes, Again, the plan runs on a calendar year, so we get six months of savings for our fiscal year. Citywide, we get about three and a half million dollars of savings. Annually, that's about seven million bucks. Um, that is not inconsequential. In the general fund, that's about 1.8 million. Um, that's going to allow uh, over a full year for about 3.6 million of savings. That is more police officers, more firefighters, uh, additional uh, wage and benefit opportunities. That is additional infrastructure investment and blight removal. Uh, some of the things we've talked about that eliminate that social and economic inequality gap in our community. Um, every city fund is impacted by this. Every city fund has employees, um, except for some of the sales taxes that are for equipment, of course. But, for example, in Power and Light, over the course of a full year, that is a $2 million annual savings. That is the equivalent of a 2% rate reduction, which you've been watching council meetings lately, has been a little bit of a topic of conversation. So uh, that affords us to make some of the investments uh, that we feel like we're hearing from um, our residents. Um, jump. If we don't do it, um, we, need, we need to do some more homework. Uh, we need to tackle, again, that $3.6 million general fund shortfall. Um, the budget has an investment of just short of a million dollars of new services. Some of the things we've touched on so far and a few more I'll talk about in a moment. Um, we need to scale back on that million dollar investment. Um, I'll be very frank with you, as I have with every group I get a chance to talk to. Um, I've worked for the city for seven years now. I've been the manager just over the last two. Um, we have done a lot of creative thinking the last few years. Um, we've done a lot of restructuring. We've done a lot of deferrals. Uh, we've done a lot of things to try to accommodate these budget challenges that we've talked about. Um, there is no one person. There is no one thing. There is no one circumstance that has caused this. It is generational. Um, it is a shifting environment. Um, there is no boogeyman that we can all go kick in the shins about this. But that said, it does have a real impact. Um, and I am, I am sorry to say that we have reached a point where we are down to closing things down, reducing services, and probably looking at reducing more staff if we're not able to make those. Um, I will say that I believe these kind of decisions benefit from as much input and as much insight and as much involvement as possible. I do not think that my team and I are anywhere near um, experts on this. So if there are additional ideas, if there are additional concepts, uh, we welcome those. Um, we are here to serve. And the ideas that people bring us oftentimes help us with that. So um, we welcome that conversation. In fact, um, I would say we are probably desperate for that input and conversation. 
Uh, we do have two more areas um, of the strategic plan that are funded in this budget, and I'll touch on those quickly for you. Um, as you've just seen, growing this city and this economy uh, locally is critical. Otherwise, no matter how many changes we make, we're going to keep showing up doing this every year, and it's really a tradition that, quite frankly, I'd like to end. Um, so we need to figure out how to bring new employers in here. We need better choices on housing stock. And quite frankly, our calling card should and could be our historic sites if we make those desirable and attractive to where people want to come and visit them and want to come stay and you know, just do more than two hours at the Trails Museum and then leave town. We want people to start staying overnight. So there's a couple things that we funded here. One of those, we don't really have a concept around housing right now. In fact, our concept is out east, we hope somebody comes and builds new stuff, and out west, go knock down the ugly stuff. Um, so far, not working that well for us. So we've put money in the budget, about $25,000, to partner on a national housing study to try to get more strategic about what we're doing here uh, and find our way through the fog. Again, I talked to you that I believe our historic sites could be our bread and butter and become one of our new economic engines as we move away from retail sales. So there's some things that we've funded in here. Um, I don't want to waste your time reading through all those, but as you can see, we are trying to invest in and promote telling people to come visit Independence and making it worth their time to come. Uh, one of the probably more substantial funding sources uh, is our tourism fund where we are putting $50,000 towards increased promotion. So you go out to the Royals game, it's in between innings, an ad runs on Crown Vision that says, come see these great historic sites in Independence. Uh, there's 40,000 captive eyeballs, if the Royals are playing well, uh, that see that. So that's our goal to try to do that. Last area is quality. Quality is when I talk about some of the more challenging parts of the plan, this is really where I'm talking about. What are the things that are going to make the city look better? What are the things that are going to make us safer? What are the things that are going to make our infrastructure present better and hold up over time? Um, we have a number of things that we funded here. Um, significant investments uh, in public infrastructure. Um, so I have one council member that jokes that um, street sweepers are like unicorns in Independence. You never hear about them. You just hear them talked about. Uh, and we have three street sweepers, but on a good day, one of those works. So this is two new street sweepers to try to clean out the gutters, the salt, the sand, the cigarette butts, et cetera. Uh, we had a whale of a winter last year. We ran out of salt. There's a dirty little secret for you. Um, so we are not going to hedge our bet on that again this year. So we're going to purchase additional salt. Um, there are a number of technology enhancements for public works. We hear from the development community that we can always be doing more to get uh, a streamlined process get people through quicker. So these are some of the funding things that will help with that. Um, and then of course, investments in our uh, water treatment plant. Uh, big thing I wanna ha harp on here, um, our street sales tax fund, we're very fortunate to have that. Two years ago, our voters made that perpetual. Um, but when you really look down at the individual components, the amounts that are set aside, it's hard to make substantial investments every year. So what we're looking to do here, or take some of the dollars from that and issue those as revenue to do a, a pretty substantial bond, uh, $13 million, in fact. And, and actually, as we continue to crunch these numbers, we believe that could even be as much as $15 million. But just to be illustrative here, uh, we can start tackling some of the busted curbs and some of the busted gutters that have been deferred. That's $1.5 million. Uh, sidewalks are a big, big issue for our residents. Increased sidewalk maintenance, $1.5 million. Um, bridges are an issue. I'm sure you've heard about MoDOT and the number of bridges that they're trying to replace. That is the same issue here. So there's $5 million for that. And then we hear from a lot of people that when you drive into Independence, sometimes it just doesn't look very nice. So we're looking at some of those key corridors like Truman Road and 24 Highway and 40 Highway, making investments in those so that those corridors do look better, that they do present nicer, and people have an increased perception of our city. Uh, and then the big one here, the last one, um, public safety. Um, some of the stuff that we heard most loud and clear in our citizen satisfaction survey, um, this was in the top three of what citizens told us they want to see invested in, particularly a police presence in their neighborhood, police presence in their uh, commercial areas, and their ability to um, uh, combat the increased crime trends. Um, so there's a couple of things we've done here. 
We never want an excuse to be that we don't put the bad guys and gals away because we don't have money for it. The cost of housing a prisoner goes up every year, so we've put 9% increase here. Uh, that takes our total budget for detention housing to $800,000. We are investing in four different sergeants. Right now, the way the uh, police department structure has worked, a number of sergeants have been pulled off other special units to supervise some of these other uh, high liability areas. When those sergeants are pulled off of that, they're not able to be out on things like tactical units and patrol, uh, working alongside the folks they supervise in the field. So this adds four sergeants there. You're jumpy. <laughs> um, two police officers as well. And then um, we are fortunate that we've seen an increased utilization among public and private events at the Uptown Market, uh, which has uh, necessitated additional off-duty officers. So this makes sure there's adequate funding uh, there for that. So really, in sum, what the budget is about is um, trying to move into a new day. Um, trying to end the annual uncertainty that we face every single year when we seem to get to the budget process, trying to keep up with this paradigm shift that's happening away from retail sales and you know franchise fees off of telephones and cable television and all those things that are going away more and more and more every single day. Trying to get more efficient with our money, where are those areas that we are heavily subsidizing thing or we are undercharging for services uh, and working collectively uh, to try to address our city's needs. Uh, the next steps, thank God every day we do this, these bullet points get less and less. We get closer to June 17. Um, the official public budget hearing, as I mentioned, is next Monday night. Uh, that is open to any resident of Independence. You need not sign up to speak. Um, there is no time limit associated with that. Um, just come at 6 p.m. Um, make your voice known on matters uh, related to the budget. Um, we are also utilizing our city scene newsletter, which goes out to all 57,000 utility account holders uh, to give them an overview of what is in the budget. So uh, with that, uh, that concludes the overview that we had, um, and we will do the questions. Do we have some of the note cards? Okay. If you can turn your note cards into the center here, we'll um, gather those together. We also have a few questions from Facebook. Um, so we'll gather those and start asking those questions. One of the questions we have on Facebook, Zach, is how will lowering benefits affect our competitive hiring to get the best police and fire personnel in the future? Right. So, yeah, I'll repeat the question. So uh, Meg read a question. We got Facebook Live going. Um, so the first question we got is, what impact will lowering benefits have on hiring and retention, particularly with public safety? Um, this is a big challenge for us. Um, we have got to make sure that we have the best people here. We have been fortunate the last few years. I will use the police department as an example. We have had a number of officers hire on with us from other agencies and other jurisdictions. And one of the things we've heard from them is the benefits package that the City of Independence offers. Um, it's also the opportunity to come and do meaningful work, but the benefits are important as well. Um, what we have been trying to do, again, we have an agency, a national health care advisor called Lockton that we've worked with. Lockton has this thing called the Book of Business where they catalog every group they work with, they do surveys. What we have found in working with Lockton, we believe that the benefits that we are offering will continue to remain at least, and in most cases, more competitive. Uh, particularly than what our peers in the region that we're directly recruiting for talent uh, and retaining talent, but also uh, nationally. So um, that is something, though, that is personally important to me because I want to make sure that not only do we have people to fill these jobs, but these are the men and women that are indicative of the values and the ethics that we want to promote here at the City of Independence. This is, was presented um, to our, I believe we're referring to our Stay Well Advisory Committee along with our Labor Coalition on fr this past Friday. Um, there are um, about four to five weeks that elapse before the council makes the uh, final vote. So we're hoping to work with the committee over the course of the next five weeks to uh, um, generate a formal um, 
recommendation that they would like to provide. They received it Friday. We had a, a meeting and then we presented the budget to council on uh, Monday. So, I just kind of saying the question was, to over, was the oversight committee adequately given time to review this and write it? And the answer was that we did it on Friday. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. Have the long term expenditures which healthcare can be attributed to been controlled in the past? i.e. when is the last time there was a premium increase for the plan and have there has there been any recommendations from the oversight committee the last time we had a premium increase was five years ago about five years ago um, and that is a direct result i'm going to say it every time i get a chance of the stay well advisory committee's work they have uh, made themselves uh, experts I, I sometimes don't know at these meetings if folks want to be personally recognized so i'm going to avoid that but there are representatives of that committee here tonight. Um, they have volunteered, they do not get paid for this, they have volunteered their time uh, to become experts on our health insurance plan. Uh, because of their hard work, we have staved off an increase for the last five years, um, and then they've made a recommendation to have a premium increase this year. And when they make an increase, it's not because anybody thinks it's fun, it's because the Stay Well Fund, the city is self-funded, the Stay Well Fund is beginning to churn negative and we have to infuse it with additional revenues to make sure that it doesn't um, uh, fall into a deficit. Does this budget include smart meters? No. Um, no. The, uh, and for the question, um, let me be very specific about this because um, I don't want to get tripped up here. The, the budget has in what we call a fund balance. So fund balance is like your savings account, okay? And we have different components of fund balance. And in the utility funds, there are reserve funds set aside if, if the city moves forward with smart meters. Right now, we have a valid initiative petition of citizen signatures uh, that calls for either an election or a council vote to um, cease moving forward with that project. Um, and if that is the case, then those funds would be allocated for a different use. How are you planning on equalizing the west and the east sides of town? Upkeep of property, income, et cetera. Yeah. Um, it's not going to be overnight. So these are generational issues, right? Um, Western Independence, went some, at one point in time, somebody built a house and it was a brand new house. Um, a lack of investment over time, um, a <coughs> lack of quality schools, I would be as bold to say when the Kansas City public school system had it there towards the end. A lot of issues contributed to um, the backsliding of that area from an economic standpoint and from a social standpoint. Our strategy, which is a generational strategy, is to begin to invest in public safety so that there's adequate medical and police uh, and fire services provided to that area where the demand, statistics bear out the demand is greater. I don't know if you know this, but on any given night, and there's about 78 square miles in this city, uh, and there's about 12 police officers out patrolling the city. Uh, maybe as far east as Seven Highway, um, and have a call that they've got to try to get uh, uh, multiple officers responding up to that zip code that we showed in the northwest. So trying to have adequate police personnel, trying to have, we did a building a healthier independence survey, I'm looking for Christina, about five, six years ago that pointed out there's a direct correlation between a lack of quality parks and sidewalks and other public health amenities and people's health in that area. Issues of obesity and diabetes and other chronic conditions as a result of a lack of mobility and finally, we've got to start getting some jobs in here, not only because we're losing money, because you know there are no more department stores coming, there are no more retail stores coming, but also because those jobs, quite frankly, don't pay as well. So if we can get more office jobs, more industrial and manufacturing jobs, this city stands to benefit from a revenue position and our citizens are empowered with a better um, living wage. How will retirees be notified of the meetings for additional information on health insurance? Right, so um, we have um, uh, the ability to push information out through a retiree portal. We also have um, a retiree email distribution list. Um, retirees have representation on that Stay Well Committee that I mentioned. Um, so we'll work through all of those mediums, including social media, to try to get 
uh, as much awareness out there as possible um, um, to get folks at those meetings so they can find out how this impacts them. Will the decreased health insurance subsidies for pre-65 employees affect already retired or start with the newly retired? So right now, um, again, these are proposals as we've drafted that, that would be in effect for everyone right now. Um, again, we've started to get some feedback about that already and we're crunching the numbers on what that looks like if we move to folks who um, graduate into that uh, particular class. So uh, we're trying to work through that to try to understand the impact of that and see if the proposal makes sense to modify that. Why are retirees asked to shoulder a much higher percentage when they are in a set income and don't have the opportunity to seek out other employment with more desirable health care plans? So again, I don't expect anybody to like any of this. Um, it's not particularly fun for you and it's not particularly fun for me. The obligation that we have under the state constitution, which says we have to have a balanced budget, and the charter, which says we have to have a balanced budget, um, is to do just that. Um, these are some of the most substantial costs uh, in our budget. Um, what we're looking to try to do is, is make changes that impact everybody so it doesn't seem to adversely impact one group more so than the other. Um, I understand that it, it certainly is a change, and I appreciate and respect that, um, but that is the uh, uh, thought process behind it. Um, though I don't expect anybody to, uh, to like or, or certainly love that. What percentage will City pay for the KC Blue buy-up or KC Blue plan? So, Adam, um, on this one, the City, there's, there's a, okay, so I'm going to try to simplify this as much as I can. Um, insurance companies want our business, especially when there's a large pool of people. When we have over a thousand retirees, that catches people's attention. If all of you went out individually, they probably, quite frankly, wouldn't care as much because we are bringing you as a group, as the City of Independence retirees, they have quoted us um, a cost that would be far below what somebody could uh, command just as a private citizen going out trying to get that. But because you are a group, there is a fee that the City of Independence has to pay for our members to get that and I don't, off the top of my head, I do not remember what that fee is. I want to play prices right for a minute here and see. Huh? 150? Okay. Work. I was, I was asking if you are paying 80 20 or 50 50, uh -huh. what percentage okay. is that okay. for the KC? So I don't, I don't think it's a true 80 20 split. I think it's just set costs of um, here's how much it costs to go to the doctor, here's how much it costs to get scripts. So are you paying anything? Is the city no, paying just that. Percentage of just, just, no, no, just that fee. Okay. Power and light funds for rebuilding substations and lines, does that not come from the IPL budget, not the general fund? That's correct. And, Whoever asked that, if I can, I mean, that's, yes, that's true. Um, we have a citizen asking questions online. Um, basically, do we believe 1.5 million is enough to address the sidewalk issues in the city of Independence? No. Um, we did a deferred maintenance report a few years ago when I got hired just to try to catalog uh, what these different costs by different type was um, all in. That was about a billion dollars of deferred maintenance. I'll tell you the most significant part of that number is a little skewed though, because at the time we knew the Blue Valley power plant uh, was becoming obsolete. Uh, the cost of rebuilding that was something like a quarter of a billion dollars, like 250, 250 million. Um, that does not appear to be the route that we're headed to now. So that billion dollar number is substantially less than that. But no, um, 1.5 million is but a start towards a much larger deferred maintenance problem. Tim, I don't know if you have a number you want me to spit out. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. It, it, it would be triaging the worst of the worst, but it's not a uh, you know a total solution to the problem. There is currently a 9.1 percent unrestricted fund balance. What is that in dollars? How much more is it increasing this year, and when can that money be used? Okay, so when 
couple years ago when I was working uh, in a different position with the city, the general fund had a fund balance of about 2.4%, uh, which was pretty pitifully low, to be honest with you. Um, when I was hired, that was a little closer to 5%. The last two years, we've been able to nearly double that, so it's just a shade over 9% now. Council, uh, in accordance with national standards for best practices for financial management, has adopted a fund balance policy of 16%, uh, which is more of the industry norm. This year, we're contributing pretty meager amount towards that, which is about $75,000. Um, that won't raise it a lot, but it's a step in, in the proposed budget. It's a step in the right direction. In terms of dollars, I got so many numbers rattling around in my mind, I don't want to give a bad one. Who's that? About 7.5 million, our budget manager says. Um, that's an approximation. Um, but the goal would be to try to work that number up, that in the event that there were some sort of catastrophic issue or something like that, we're more in line with. Um, by the way, some, some of our cities, I would say, err on the side of having, my opinion only, a more irresponsible amount, like 50%. Um, I think that's excessive, but that shows you kind of in comparison where we're at sitting at 9% right now. What is the document called that reports what the city actively spent in previous years? Is it published publicly? Uh, we, I believe we are referring to a line item supplement. Um, we can get copies of that made available. Um, you know, co costs of printing are not cheap, and so what we've done is put a lot of this stuff online. Um, but we can try to make that information available. We were planning to present and print, I should say print, um, adopted copies uh, more generally for the public, um, but we can make those available uh, upon request. Um, contact our office and we'll try to work with you. It, it is a voluminous document, so um, if there's specific areas that are of interest, we could work with you to get that information. It's called the line item supplement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The budget is available online as well as the CAFR. It is under the budget section of the website. There is a listing of budget documents that you can find under um, the budget section. And then I, I will just... But the actual, I, <coughs> but the actual expenditures and revenues are not... The, or previous or current years? The edited or if you want to call it actual. For, for previous years. The acronym they're throwing around is CAFR, which stands for Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Leave it to accountants to come up with a boring name. But if there's specific costs that people would like to know for this year's budget, um, let us know and we'll, we'll get that information out uh, uh, as needed. What will the Staywell's projected liabilities be if these changes are imposed? I don't know that I understand the, the question. Are we referring to the Staywell Clinic? Maybe that's something that we could, we're working on a frequently asked question list to prepare publicly right now. I'd like to add that to that to put what that specific financial estimated position would be. Um, um, but I, I do understand the intent of the question and I'll make sure that that gets um, added on there so we understand both percentage wise and, and dollar amount wise what the fund projection and position looks like. Yeah, you're welcome. Is water and, power, water and power and light funds separate from general fund? Yeah, so we have um, strict rules that says we can't commingle funds. Um, so power and light is an enterprise fund. Those dollars can be spent for utility related purposes. Same for water, same for sewer. The general fund has the most diversity in it. It has many different city departments like police and fire, um, the internal services like finance, um, it has public works, it has some parks and rec and uh, stuff in it. Then there are voter approved funds, we call those special revenue funds. Those are the sales taxes for streets and police and fire, stormwater um, and parks. 
And then we have, of course, the voter approved tourism fund, a transient guest tax. And finally, if you really want to know, we also have the funds that are set up specifically for the economic incentives. So um, TIF projects have their own fund. Um, community improvement districts have their own fund. Each of those funds are segregated and accounted for separately, though, and can't be used to support the other. And this is one just to uh, quickly go over. Will you be cutting services to Indy Bus? Y yes. Um, we are reducing total annual operating hours by 1,730 hours, three hours for Saturday service, one hour per week on, um, on specific routes. Um, I believe they're the orange and yellow routes, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, those are the ones where we saw, um, based on data, utilization is, is such that the cost of providing that service far exceeds the ridership revenue that's coming in from it. Do you speak for the council? Are they in approval of your budget? Oh, heavens no, I don't speak for the council. Um, my job is to make a recommendation to the council. The council's job is to, based on input from citizens and from employees and from retirees and from whoever else upon they draw their input, uh, to make the decision that they believe is in the best interest of the city. So, I mean, I know this insurance stuff's a big uh, issue and a big concern. Um, that's where I feel like my job has been to make recommendations to them about how to manage the city's overall finances, to try to present to them in the most responsible, um, non-hyperbolic way what happens if these changes are implemented and what happens if these changes aren't. Um, and then my job, quite frankly, is to get out of the way and let the council evaluate this information and take um, input from their constituencies and make, again, those votes and decisions that are in their best interest. Um, if I got upset about every time they didn't agree with me, um, I, would, I would not be in good shape. Their job uh, is often to decide um, to take things a different direction, and that is their right and, their, quite frankly, their responsibility. Will HSA only be offered to new OAP2 members? Will it be open to OAP1 members as well? So what we call OAP1 right now and what we call OAP2 are going to look a little different. We are contractually obligated uh, in one of our work agreements to provide a plan to members in that work group um, that is an 80-20 split. What we're doing here is making that 80-20 obligation um, aligned with the OAP2, which becomes the Qualified High Deductible Plan with the Health Savings Account. The Health Savings Account would not, it does not translate to what the OAP1 plan would be, which is called a Defined Contribution Plan. Um, so the HSA is only tied to uh, that plan. And Adam is going to speak up. This is Adam Norris, our assistant city manager. So, make sure I got the question right. So if anybody, it's, the question is, is, is it going to be offered to only new OAP2 members? No. If anybody is currently on an OAP, is currently on OAP2, the HSA contribution that the city would provide would, would be uh, available to them. So that's... Yeah. Will OAP-1 still be offered at what cost to members to city? Yeah, so OAP-1 will still continue to be offered. It's going to look different. The costs are going to go up because it's going to become what we call a defined contribution plan. Um, it's, it's not going to look the way it has in the past where there's a true, you know, percent split, but if you quantify that, this year it's about a 70-30 split. I mean, just trying to translate it back but it, it works based on the, it's a percentage of the number of people that are on the other plan. That will drive the cost of the defined contribution to the other plan. Um, this is from Facebook. Why has the legalization of marijuana and revenue from those businesses not been considered? Uh, so voters last fall voted in the legalization of medical marijuana in the state of Missouri. Um, that was done through what's called an initiative petition process. So their petition simply said to legalize it. Now the uh, rule makers in Jefferson City and the state of Missouri have to work on actually coming up with what does that look like? What are the rules around that? How will these be regulated? How will they function? Um, the cities, the municipalities then have to come up with zoning laws and things like that that impact where these can operate, when they can operate, things like that. So our best guess is it will probably be later this fall, a year after it was approved, before you're going to start to see the issuance of permits for those. Um, so that is not going to impact our business model this year. There's the potential for that to do that in future years. Um, 
again, I'm speaking personally here. One of the things that's going to be interesting to see with that, because marijuana, both recreational and medical, has not been legalized nationwide, purchase of that cannot be done through your traditional financial institutions. So you can't pay with check, you can't pay with card, you can only pay with cash. So we're gonna be on the honor system here that the shops and facilities are providing a true representation of what their gross sales were and then what their um, corresponding business license fees would be. Will retirees over 65 plan coverage with Blue KC be a contract so Blue KC is locked into premium and agreed to or are retirees looking at losing advertised premium? Uh, this would be an agreement with Blue KC. Um, this has simply been going out to get a quote right now. So then what we have to do, our process, the way it works, is we have to take it to the council to get approval to set the terms of the length of the contract and the agreement. Um, so it's, it's difficult for me to say, um, you know, if that's going to be a 10-year contract, a five-year contract. That will have to then be finally negotiated and taken. But what we're representing here is what their initial proposal to us was. Um, and the back and forth that we've had just in trying to um, make sure that this is, is as aligned and similar to what retirees have been used to from a coverage standpoint. Are we using other funding mechanisms like Fed and state grants to augment our budget? We are. The problem with grants is twofold. One, um, they're um, becoming more and more scarce. Um, if you follow the news, there's a lot of conversation about cutting um, tax credits. There's a lot of conversation about rolling back different programs like community development block grant funding, which um, the City of Independence gets about three quarters of a million dollars every year. So that's one problem. They're becoming more scarce. The second problem is those grants are awarded for a specific purpose. Um, very, very rarely are those grants awarded to support long-term wage and benefits. Uh, typically, they may carry a few but those are typically going to be for things more like projects or you know housing or something like that so they they are valuable for the limited use that they have but they are limited in the use that we we use those for can we offer stay well at no cost to over age 65 retirees right now uh, medicare rules say no um, i had a question from uh, somebody today about well could the city of independence just arbitrarily decide um, that we're going to say post 65 retirees you can go to the stay well clinic um, i don't know is the answer that question came at us today um, i know that in the past um, that medicare will not bill for our post 65 retirees to go to that clinic what happened to the three million dollars in reserve in our stay well account um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what that refers to other than to say that uh, over time the, the job uh, that we all have is to manage uh, the revenues into that, which are the premiums that we all pay, uh, as well as you know monitor the expenses. Um, I wanna make sure I don't get this backwards, but I believe it was a 6% increase for me medical trend this year and 13% increase for pharmaceutical trend. I hope, I, but either way, the cost of those have both been going up, which draws down upon the fund more and more every year. And that's where the premium increase has been necessitated from. Um, I was not privy to this, um, but in, in the past, I know there have been decisions made by management to do um, moratoriums, uh, and that had adverse impact on the stability of the fund. Um, so different decisions uh, in, uh, in the past, along with the increasing cost of health insurance, draws down that fund over time. Why is it necessary for the city to spend money to maintain the Inglewood Theater? Well. Uh, I would say our city council said Monday night it's not. Um, there was a resolution put forward that had it been approved would have um, pledged the city's, my words here, strong interest in operating that theater if it were acquired by a private party. Um, that question uh, that was just asked was asked by many on our city council and that question, uh, that issue, that resolution that was brought forward by a council member um, was voted down by the majority of the council. So um, as far as we're concerned today, that, that issue's been settled. When is the last time the city had a balanced budget? Every year is the answer um, because we have to adopt a balanced budget. Um, when's the last time the city started a budget development process with a balanced budget? 
hasn't happened in the seven years I've been here. Um, and I worked in the Kansas City, Missouri budget office for five years prior to that, and it didn't happen there. Um, this evolution that I keep talking about has been happening for some time now, and um, and so I don't, I don't know is the answer um, when the last time the city had the opportunity to start the year with a surplus of funds. Are you going to be self-insured? We are a self-insured plan right now, and there's no discussion about changing that. How is the decreasing amount of employees, retirees, living going to affect our current Cigna contract? Can you read that again? How is the de decreasing how is decreasing the amount of employees, retirees' lives going to affect our current Cigna contract? Uh, the contract with Cigna remains the same. I know there's there's a front part of that question about the adverse impact that. Um, you know, what does that mean to individuals, whether active or retirees? Um, our contract with Cigna holds true, though. Um, we have a negotiated contract. Again, we're fortunate to work with a committee of professionals who have negotiated a very sound contract. Um, Adam wants to say something again. If uh, the retirees, if there are less people on the plan, there is a modest fee that we would need to pay. That also needs to be renegotiated with Cigna, but there would be a fee associated with that, which is far less than the savings that could be generated from from this change thank you if stable clinic is underused and costing one million why not close it it's easy to look at black and white numbers okay it's easy to look at that and say it's costing a million bucks shut it down um, we have worked with a different insurance advisor in the past who will tell you that there are unmeasurable benefits of having that clinic um, Right now, if you work at City Hall, it's really easy to get over to that clinic um, and, and get back to work, which as an employer, we like. It's, it's good when employees are at work. Uh, that clinic is providing a tremendous benefit in preventative disease management, helping people deal with issues of, of weight management, of smoking cessation, of, of high blood pressure, of diabetes, things that can become very costly to the insurance plan if they're managed by prescription drugs and can become very detrimental to our workforce and our employees if those conditions become fatal. So having that clinic and catching some of these issues, um, folks, if we save one employee's life, um, we're better off. Um, if we save one employee from having to go on blood pressure medicine or we help one employee get off of that, we're better off. So our long-term objective is to find a way to close that gap but still meet that outcome of helping our employees get to and stay at work and manage the long-term health insurance costs so that the overall city, these dollars aren't going into increased premiums as drastically, et cetera. Um, I believe one of the reasons that we've been able to stave off larger premium increases in addition to superior insight and advisement from that committee has been the role that that clinic has played. Um, so that's something that we're gonna have to look at uh, as we evaluate our options there. Um, how do we get the same outcome but close that million dollar deficit. Why weren't premium increases thought through the, why weren't premiums increased through the past five years so that the stay well fund would have been more efficient? It, um, it, that's just not the way it works. Um, it's a matter of looking at our, our committee does a great job of saying, how much is the plan costing us? How much revenue is it generating in premiums? and what is the trend forecasting out? Uh, where's that crossover point? Is there a sufficient um, coverage, the term that we use is coverage, to manage the costs that are coming in? Um, when we start to dip below a certain amount, that's when the alarm bells start to go off. So over the course of the last five years, it's been the recommendation of the committee, and at least the last two years that I've been the manager, um, my, I concur with the committee that that has not been necessitated. We do not want to um, erroneously or unnecessarily increase people's cost of insurance if it's not necessitated and the fund has not needed it over the course of the last five years. Are you separating retirees from employees to make it easier to drop retirees? No. So we did a what we call a leadership exchange trip um, a few years ago down to Springfield, Missouri. We took um, uh, a group of um, city folk down and met with our counterparts in Springfield. And Springfield got themselves, um, just like every city finds themselves in, uh, in a world of, of financial trouble um, through decreased revenues, et cetera. 
Um, Springfield, um, as you might imagine, has a lot different um, um, demographics and a lot different um, viewpoints. Um, they, overnight, one vote of the city council dropped retiree health insurance. Um, to me, that is arbitrary and capricious and from the day I've heard that, that has always stuck in the back of my mind. Um, and as long as I'm fortunate to be here, um, that won't be on the table. Um, we have a detailed question on Facebook about chiropractors being backed in, being added back into healthcare coverage. I believe that would be better answered during those locked in uh, detailed discussions. So we'll, we'll move that to the locked in questions. I will say, um, again, there, there were evaluations made about the cost benefit of chiropractic care. Um, again, the committee works very diligently to identify all the different um, associated benefits. Um, the committee's come forward with a number of recommendations like um, rehab therapy and, and some of those things over the last few years. So we're, um, we're going to look at that consistently. Um, but that, that in the past, and, and we'll get into chiropractic care as Meg said more, but just a high level answer there. Are you saying that the city will provide HSA for retired employees when we were not allowed to be in the HAC, HSA at the time of retirement? So any retiree who is younger than age 65 um, will have the option to elect to move to the plan two, the qualified high deductible plan. They will have an HSA established and the city will make annual contributions to that HSA. Um, regardless of where you're at right now, regardless of which plan you're on or where you're at, if you're a retiree or you're not, um, anybody who becomes a retiree or is a retiree today between the ages of 55 and 65 will have the opportunity to move to the plan two and to receive uh, an HSA with the city contribution. When will the changes, if passed, take effect on the insurance? Good question. Our plan year begins January the 1st, so that's when the uh, plan changes would take effect. Uh, that's why the savings that I talked about tonight uh, associated with the proposals are only captured for a six-month period um, because they would not begin until the plan year begins <coughs> on January the 1st. Um, recently, an employee has to work for the city for 20 years before taking benefits with them upon retirement. Will this change? It changed last year. Um, so the evolution of that, at one point in time, an employee only had to work five years to accrue that benefit. Um, a number of years ago, the city changed that to work for 20 years to accrue that benefit. Um, last year, uh, it was adopted that any employee hired on or after July the 1st uh, can elect to stay on the city insurance, but at retirement, they would pay 100% of the premium. Those are all the questions that we have had turned in via the cards and Facebook at this time. So we'll go ahead and wrap up. If there are other questions that are asked on Facebook or you have, we will make sure that those locked in informations, particularly around insurance, are made available. Pay, um, we'll be sending out information via email um, on social media, um, as many different places as we can get it out about when we get these dates and times and locations locked in. Again, our goal is to try to have at least three and to try to present those at different times to try to afford you know, people's schedules. So a morning, around the lunchtime and in the evening, um, we will get that information out. Um, the public hearing for the council is this coming Monday night. And again, just from a personal standpoint, as much um, feedback, input, ideas that you have, uh, about how to either um, address some of these insurance issues or how to tackle a 3.6 million shortfall in the general fund. Absent those changes, um, I'm personally asking for everybody's help and input on that. Thank you for coming out tonight um, and thank you for uh, your participation. Have a good night.